Okay, so thank you very much. Let's go. Before I start discussing the philosophical output, or perhaps even the philosophical questions raised by this paper, I think it's important to give a brief introduction to the game and to why I am standing here talking about it. So the paper is about something, something, soup, something. Should have said that. Something, something, soup, something is a game designed by Stefano Gualeni, a person who most of you probably know from previous papers in this conference series and from him sitting in this room. As many of you also know, he is usually the person talking about how games can be philosophical tools. As a success, continues to work on these ideas, except this time I was also involved in it, which is why I am the one sitting down here presenting this paper. As a success is a game where you play as a kitchen handler, receiving food items from a distant space colony populated by aliens, who do not have the same conception of language that we do. The concept of soup is alien to them, so humans before you form the definitional basis for their understanding. However, both due to them still not sharing a similar cognitive framework, as well as space interference in the radio signal, the soup delivered is often less than ideal. The player's job is to determine whether the delivery is soup or not soup, using solely their personal judgment. In this game's inception, I had just opened my uh, master's thesis where I used cognitive linguistics, specifically, specifically Roshan Mervis' work, as a basis to discuss why the definition of games is still very fuzzy. So I had very strong opinions about Stefano's game, specifically his methodology to determine soupness. So he recruited me as a field researcher. This prestigious title puts the mythology squarely on two entities, time constraints and me. Since then, the game has garnered considerable mainstream attention with outlets such as Kotaku picking it up and discussing it in detail. More importantly, it has led a lot of people to discuss soupness in the way we expected them to, with a lot of confusion. There was a disparity about what they thought constituted a soup and what they felt a soup was. This disparity is not an unfamiliar one. In philosophical discussions around definitions, there are often discrepancies in different definitions and soup not present an exception. One question then becomes whether this discrepancy manifests itself differently when the methods of definition forming changes from a textual one to a visual one. To test this out, we started off by running text experiments based off Roche and Mervis's work. Eleanor Roche, later accompanied by Carl and Mervis, applied Wittgenstein's theories on definitions within cognitive linguistics. Their work led to some more clarity and quantifiability to Wittgenstein's work by introducing a new concept to Wittgenstein's theories with the hopes of having something measurable. One of these concepts was prototype theory. They explain how when we are judging whether a sub new subcontext fits within our cognitive model of its family concept, we are basing it off of a prototype, a cognitive median of all the things we associate with that concept. For example, let us consider being asked about the 101st bird being introduced into our life. When we are being asked what a bird is, we may be very tempted to say that a bird is an animal that flies, despite not all of them flying. If we are presented with a non-flying bird for the first time, ever, we might choose to dismiss these as non-birds, and this would not necessarily be false with our cognitive model. If we are presented with a non-flying bird for the second time, we might, and most likely would, still dismiss these as non-birds, due to their low-level membership within our cognitive model. Non-flying birds would have a sub-1% incidence. However, birds fly would no longer be true within our cognitive model, as we have at least one incidence of a non-flying bird. Yet again, Roche and Mervis explain, and show in one of their experiments, that we would likely still dismiss it as not a bird, as we form definitions based on our prototype, which aggregate, aggregates the features most often present, rather than the features that might be present. If we were presented with our 500th non-flying bird, with no new flying birds, we would very likely say the opposite, that birds tend not to fly. If flight is a defining feature within the bird bird family, it's not. Something such as a sparrow, an eagle, or a hawk would have a high membership rate, so uh, these are often per as these are often perceived to be flying. Something such as a dodo, a kiwi, or a kakapo would have a low membership rate, as they don't fly. Birds that can fly, but are not associated with flying, such as perhaps chickens, peacocks, or turkeys, would perhaps be mid-level members. Another concept which they explain is word categories. They discuss how a word can belong in three different types of word categories, superordinate, basic level, and subordinate. Definitional fuzziness tends to occur in superordinate categories, as this category contains a high level of generability and wide degree of membership. This means that when we discuss superordinate category words, we are not very exclusive. On the other hand, subordinate category words would have a low level of generability and a narrow degree of membership. This means that when we discuss subordinate categories, we are very exclusive. 
if we were to put this on a spectrum, we could argue that games, and I would, would lean towards su super oriented categories, while Super Mario Brothers, the game specifically, would be the tightest example of a subordinate category. It would still be its own category because it includes different members, so that's true transmediality. Somewhere along the spectrum, we could find main franchise Super Mario games, which I would argue still remain close to subordinate categories, and platformer games, which would perhaps be somewhere within basic level categories. As you can see, categories as a model is still nominal benchmarks, <coughs> but it allows us to explain the reason as for fuzziness better. In this presentation, I will not make arguments. Sorry about that. I will not make arguments for games or in this soup to belong to any worth category, but I instead make claims of higher level category, which means that the object is more close to a superordinate or lower level category, which means that the object in question is more like a subordinate category to maintain this, the spectrum over three defining terms. Based especially on Roche and Murph's 1976 experiments, we ran an experiment to determine what a soup is or whether, where a soup lies. We ran one experiment on four different focus groups of 10 or 12 people each, to a total of 44 respondents, and thank you for the people that participated in these. This experiment was divided into three parts, looking at formal property testing, closest non-category members, and prototypical members. One of the above groups was also a control group that was explicitly told what we were testing. They were all linguistic students that, who had studied Roche and Merv's theories. This was done in order to see if there was any difference uh, in results when respondents knew their cognitive frameworks were being tested, which did not seem to be the case. Our respondents were put into pairs, each being shown a word, soup or bird, which they were to keep hidden from their partner. They were then instructed to list down all the components that they felt defined that, that object within a minute and a half. In this part, we were primarily looking at the formal properties of soup. We wanted to see if there was a pervasive formal property in all these soup definitions, which gave us the following results. The difference between property and type instance being listed over here, these are the results by the way, is that the former lists the former property exactly as they listed it, while in the latter I made judgment calls to include certain properties together. This is why edible has a larger instance rate than the number of respondents. There were six properties that were included in this property typing. Edible, eaten with a spoon, eaten, can be digested, food, and eaten when it is cold. Some respondents listed more than one of these property typings. In all, some types of comestibility was mentioned all but one time. So the closest we can get to a universal property would be ed edibility with a 95% instance rate. Soup says though seem to have a lower generability rate than birds, with the latter holding five different formal properties with a 50% incidence rate, not uh, typed instances, but other formal properties, which were feathered, pedal, beaked, winged, and lays eggs. I would speculate that this is probably because soup is in a higher word category than birds. In the second part of the experiment, we made the respondents switch papers with each other, and based on the former properties that the other person listed, they were to guess which item their partner was describing. Over 50% of the respondents managed to guess that their partner was describing soup. The rest of the results were scattered, with two respondents guess either coffee or water, and single respondents guessing pudding, bottle, drinks, rice, and lemonade. This experiment, which tried to establish the closest non-category member, seemed to focus on the li liquid element of soup, with the exception of rice, and perhaps bottle, but bottle I would suspect would be a bottle of water. This shows that while being liquid is something that soup often is, this is not a core feature only within soup, which would suggest that it is perhaps not the only property we use to distinguish soup from not soup. This experiment would also suggest that soup is a higher category member than birds. The Mering experiment showed that all 22 respondents guessed either bird or a lower category member of the bird family, such as eagle twice and chicken once. Meanwhile, no respondent guessed a type of soup as their answer. The former properties of birds are much more descriptive of birds, and the members of birds are more clearly defined than the members of soup. This will be confirmed in the third and final part of our experiment. In the last part, they were told to swap papers. The original former property writer would have half a minute to list three different types of soup or bird. Uh, the soup listed were very various and often unnamed. The soup mentioned most at seven times was chicken soup, which might not necessarily immediately evoke a particular type of soup. It's just a soup with chicken in it. A creamy French-style consommé, 
is very different than a Cantonese chicken bone soup. The name soup most often were minestrone and gazpacho, both appearing as five times each. As I explained above, this seems to indicate that the members of soup category are ill-defined, especially compared to bird. And with birds, respondents were very happy to name lots of different types of birds, including eagle at six, sparrow at six, chicken at five, ducks at four, and so on and so forth. The first part of this experiment was a textual positive one. We gave people a word and asked them to describe what it was. The second part of the experiment was the negatory. We gave people formal properties and asked them to tell us what they thought the object being described was, negating whether these formal properties constitute soup. The game we designed was only negatory, so I'll be comparing most of this second experiment with the uh, Ludic experiment. We gave users procedure generated objects and they had to decide whether it was or was not soup. The soup was procedure generated by making arrays of the most common formal properties, which we showed above. These contained at least one confirmatory, one negatory, with some containing disambiguators. For example, within the comestible section, we had edible food, carrots, edible but harmful, poisonous mushrooms, edible but harmless, sorry, inedible but harmless, a cocktail umbrella, and inedible but and harmful, batteries. Edible food confirms the formal property, Inedible and harmful negates the former property, while the other two sections do neither, but shed a bit more light about what constitutes comestibility, since it's not perfectly clear whether it is capability of eating a soup or advisability of eating that soup. Each section of each former property meets each section of each other former property at least once. So if there are three sections for bowl usage, bowl, bowl-like, and not bowl-like, each of these three sections will be paired up at least once with each of comestibles four sections. Likewise with the other former properties. Since the game was only negatory, it did not replicate the entire text experiment as I explained, but only the second part. More importantly, it replicated this part much better than the text-based version for various reasons. Firstly, in our text-based experiment, the respondents had to decide whether the formal properties constituted a soup or not based on their partner's idea of what a soup is. Some of the formal property lists received from their partners were less than ideal, that's why we ended up with water as one of the answers. This could have been avoided if we simply gave the respondents a similar list of definitions ourselves, as Rocha and Mervis had done. However, this would still remain an individual definition, as opposed to a social definition that the ludic experiment provides. It will be our conception of soup, which we didn't want to give. In the game, our procedural generation was based off of a positive definitional exercise of 22 respondents, but this could be scaled up. Rocha and Mervis's original experiment had a much larger sample size of over 100, Furthermore, respondent answers could inform game updates, so the way they play the game could inform how we update the game later on. The second advantage that the ludic experiment gives us over the text-based one is that cross-combining all the formal properties is much easier when it's procedure generated by the game's code, over the haphazard method employed when a respondent is given another respondent's list of formal properties. As mentioned in an earlier paragraph, each possible variant of each formal property is matched at least once with each other variant of each formal property at least once within 20 soup generations. This allows us to not only record which formal properties are highly evaluated in terms of soupness, but also record whether certain formal properties per matches are more highly evaluated than others. So while liquidness might have a certain incidence, liquidness tied with comestibility might have a higher incidence. While this is also recordable in the text-based experiment, the ludic experiment allowed us to replicate it consistently every time and record it in a much more simple and consistent manner. A third advantage is the product's adaptability and scalability. If we find that a certain formal property intersection is consistently dismissed, for example a sub-10% incidence, then we could exclude it from the procedural generation easily, while we can't tell people to stop talking about things. Similarly, if we find that a certain formal property intersection has very varying results between one rendition of the intersection and another, then we can introduce even more renditions to this intersection to determine which of these intersections is an outlier. With the text-based version, we could have close to no insight to either of these, especially the latter. For example, to make the latter example clearer, if plus liquid and plus meat were given as a combination in a text version, one person might have a stew as their cognitive prose type, while the other person might have a ramen. They might both agree that stew is not a soup, but they might both agree that ramen is a soup. However, they might answer differently because of the first distinct cognitive prototype. In the ludic experiment, 
this would be less of an issue, as they would answer to a certain visual reference with clear liquid and meat reference. And if we see a large discrepancy between stew and result, stew results and meat results, we could insert beef congee elements in there, or a chunky chicken, chicken soup element in there, and see whether stew or ramen was the outlier. While the advantage of the second experiment are clear, I hope, these advantages might be more so related to the digital computational aspects of the medium rather than the ludic ones. While the clearly ludic advantages are not as recordable as the digital computational ones, we can still hypothesize on certain advantages, at least to create space for discussion questions, if we have time. One advantage that a ludic setting might provide is the removal of the experiment setting from the experiment. From my observation, presenting the experiment as a game that collects data, as opposed to a data collection exercise, made respondents less worried about giving us the correct type of results. If anything, correctness is shifted towards proper gameplay, what will win me the game, rather than proper results, what will produce the right data. Once the game ends, respondents were often surprised to see how vague their definitions was, which supports their experiment in awareness. And even things like free-to-play games would support collecting as data as something players are unaware of. Uh, another advantage that the ludic setting provides is easier dissemination. Early on in the presentation, I mentioned how some gaming outlets picked the game up just because they found it interesting, which, would, which caught me by surprise. I, we, uh, Stefano told me yesterday we had around 30,000 new kits, which was pretty cool. I do not feel that a visual digital computational experiment in cognitive linguistics would roll off the tongue in the same way and would be so readily picked up if it did not have this ludic experiment within it. There is a final advantage of putting the experiment within a ludic setting, which is considering whether the questions we posited for soup can be posited for games as well. In our experiment for soup, as we have pointed out, we have seen that shifting from a textual negatory perspective to a visual negatory perspective also alters the way definitions are formed. It is clear that the final part of our experiment could be not be replicated like for like within digital games for a variety of reasons but the biggest one being game's resistance to being reified. Displaying a frame or a shot of a game is very different than displaying a game in process, while a shot of a soup and a soup in process, whatever that entails, are not necessarily that different. Digital games are also not necessarily visual in scope, while soup necessitates being visual, which is why the closest point of comparison for a game would be something like Pedercini's The Definition of Game. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that game. I should have included there, but I didn't, sorry which reverts to a textual negatory approach. However, there is still merit to the exploration of digital game definition outside of the current definition work. While the experiment does not completely carry over, the results we gathered kind of do. The progression of this paper, along with our soup-oriented case study, pro provides this line of thought, is that different definitional results can be achieved through a different process of definition formation. Firstly, there is value in applying a collective method to the creation of definition over the very individual positive approaches that are typical in game studies. Since Wittgenstein, or rejections of Wittgenstein seem to be one of the more popular methods in our field to construct definitions, then there must be some due rigor to seeing language as a social phenomenon rather than an individual's perspective. However, apart from more socially oriented formations of definitions, something something soup something also shows that there is some merit to alternate approaches to acquiring definitions. Utilizing Rocha Murphy's sexual negatory approaches over the current tense of textual positive approaches in our field could already render different results, as our two partite super experiments showed happening with soup. Had Pellercini's game been more than just commentary and applied some sort of methodology that was similar to Rocha Murphy's, valid results could have been generated that would have been almost definitely distinct from previous definitional work. <laughs> Similarly, finding a way to alternate the predominance sense used to form a negative definition, as we did in something something soup something, could also equally render valid alternate results for us to consider in games. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to announce that we have time for questions. I think, Pavel, is first? Yeah. That was very interesting. Um, I'm, I have two questions which are actually related because both are about methodological uh, problems that probably arise, and I'm curious if you discuss this. Maybe. Sure. So, so first thing is that you chose uh, soup, mm -hmm. which is an artifact, mm -hmm. and this is in a way interesting because in the discussion about the 
meaning of words and the notions and uh, and testing notions, it is very it is always very, a very important question whether we are asking about something that is a natural kind like the bird mm -hmm. or a, an artifact. And artifacts are much less stable when it comes to prototypes that are assigned to it. So I'm just curious if you, for example, had an idea that maybe uh, we could make a game about a weird natural uh, uh, um, kind thing like a weird plant or something like this. So that's 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 the first thing. And the second question are also methodology. Can I answer this one now? Just sure, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, we mostly used BERT because it has previous experiments that were not run by us as well, just for them to exist there. While I drew some comparisons here, we didn't really draw them while we are making the game. This was mostly just for me to explain things. So we ran the experiments, we also had, just to make sure that the data was similar to other experiments done with BERT, in terms of Rocha Mervis. If the results were similar, then at least we could say that we're running the experiment correctly. Right. Uh, so, so the other is also, about, if I may, uh, uh, the other is also about the methodology. It's, it's simply that it is. I think it's a fascinating subject, and I, I believe that uh, m more and more experiments like this will be made. Like seriously, I think so. That's a very interesting approach and fruitful. Uh, but of, of course, there's this methodological issue that if I'm going to extrapolate the data from uh, reactions to virtual objects on uh, w what I think that people think about the meanings of uh, objects in the real life, then there a, a lot of interesting questions uh, sprang up, right? Like, for example, what about realism? The, uh, uh, the game is a, has a fairly simple low-poly graphics. So, and also, I mean, there's physics, but also it's not like a super high-end physics, right? So, for example, maybe uh, people uh, rate the liquidity differently, not because they really don't care about liquidity of soup, but because the liquidity, because of the physics and the graphics, isn't represented as well as it should be. So that's how to approach this. That was an issue we had. That yeah. was one of the shortcomings that we had, and we discussed this quite, uh, quite a bit. Yeah. And the concession we made was including subtitles, which I was against and Stefano was for, for the same reason. But at the same time, I felt that if we include them, we kind of are almost reverting back to the sexual approach. So that was something that we had issues with. I'm not exactly sure how we can solve it, but yes, acknowledged for sure. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Any other questions? Go yeah. Ahead. <laughs> I have one, and hopefully you can answer. I don't know the answer for this, so it's okay if it's not answerable. I noticed uh, talking to some of our testers that the yeah. conception of soup changed during the categorization. They will start to notice that, for example, oh, maybe I need to take the cutlery into consideration. So, do you think this kind of operation is different from a questionnaire where you need to give, again, like three paradigmatic examples versus, I don't know, working for a minute on 20 different soups? I mean, does the sheer time and number of choices um, affect your results, you think, or not? Well, this, uh, let's start with the time part. As you know, we also restricted the experiment to, to very limited times, both to replicate this part of the game, but also to make sure that the definition they were giving us was the one that was preconceived in their head, rather than them thinking really hard about what soupness is and trying to make a very real definition of it. So, yes, the time definitely affects, and I'm, but I'm not sure if introducing a second questionnaire would be the same <coughs> thing as making them play the game again. Like, the advantage of the game is that it allows for an emergent definition. So, if we see that, for example, in the first five, they mark chopsticks as not as soup, but then they start marking them as soup, then at least we have the progression of results, especially if they mention it in the notes afterwards, since we discussed with them. While in a questionnaire, since this is not emergent, it's just done in a block, this would not appear. So that would be different. But, and I'm not sure that that's question actually. Absolutely. Is there more? No. No, it was precisely about that. Like, we're working with an evolving understanding as opposed to a preconceived one. So I was wondering if that changed something in using this sort of methods to gather definition yeah. of something. 
it would definitely also be interesting to see what happens after an update. Like if the same people play it again, and we had recorded who played which game, the data was anonymized, but maybe recorded with a bit different to see if it changes. Because I know some people were disappointed in the way they approached it after they approached it. Like, for example, one of our testers decided that one particular soup with rocks in it was soup, and he was super frustrated about it afterwards. He was like, it's definitely not soup, it has... Please, and that context influenced my playing it. Sure, then maybe we could have cleared the narrative, because at least in the game, the power dichotomy was very much in the human's favour. These are our new low-cost labour. Rather than outsourcing it to a different country, we outsourced it to aliens. So the idea that we're abducted by the aliens, so we have to eat anything that doesn't kill us, should have hopefully not happened in the narrative. But that's one of the disadvantages of having it being in a loose resetting rather than a straight experiment setting. You're creating a few more of these little nuggets of the ambiguity that we would not have in an experiment that might influence the results. So I'm happy you shared your experience because I didn't realize it was like an issue, but yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. Perfect. Can, then, can I add another ambiguity of that kind that we encountered? Um, the fact that the um, no sh um, narrative setting suggested that which of these soup would you serve to humans upstairs in the restaurants, but serving and having them eaten them, it's a different question, right? So due to the narrative part of it, we're asking a, perhaps a r scientifically wrong question to the to the definition of soup. Yeah, yeah, I remember that discussion. I was a bit upset about that once I found out the narrative, but yeah, that was also another issue. So. Narrative can create this, this ambiguity that might be problematic sometimes. Agreed. Great. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much, much once again.